that is read around the Pesach Seder table on, on uh, the night of Pesach. Um, and that line is the following. The Odor Vador Hayav Adam Verotat Asmok Ilu Hu Yatsav in Israel. Um, in every generation, a person is obligated to see themselves as if they left Egypt. Um, this is sort of a classic formulation of um, the ways in which Jewish practice and Jewish culture are suffused with memory, uh, with a kind of uh, remembering the past as present um, in this sort of eternal way. Um, I want to say a bit about how uh, some of the sort of major contours of how this line has been understood traditionally. Um, and then given the, the present context um, of war, of injustice um, in Israel-Palestine, I want to think about um, ways in which history and, and, and concrete circumstances must make us reinterpret tradition. Um, so uh, one common traditional uh, approach to thinking about this line uh, over the couple of thousand years of practice um, has been also to recognize that this isn't to, 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 to feel uh, the liberation um, from Egypt as a present current reality clearly is not only about some place called Egypt. <laughs> Um, and the Hebrew term uh, for Egypt meets Rhyme in the tradition, there's a common tendency to recognize ways that uh, there's that there's a, a set of, an imagined etymological root there of, of Metsarim. If you just read the same letters of different pronunciation, Metsarim, the narrow places, the narrow straits, um, Metsar Yam. And we even see in the Haggadah itself in this in this Pesach liturgy. Um, uh, recitation of the psalm beginning with the line Min HaMetzar Karati Ya from the narrow place and in this context of Pesach and imagining it's yet yeah, it's Raim of the liberation from Egypt uh, from a narrow place I called to Ya and Ya answered me in an expansive place so this um, the liberation from constriction to, to expansion and opening. So I think that's actually a lot of some of the MPA uh, that you were talking about is, is sort of one way in which uh, this leaving of Egypt, so to speak, is, um, is made present. Um, another direction that this uh, tends to go in um, is seen already in the continuation of that line in the Mishnah itself and the continuation of that line in, um, in the Haggadah itself. Um, where this is saying, uh, this is a time for you personally to feel this sense of liberation, um, at least in this as if mode, even if you are not currently free um, or currently privileged in this way. Um, in some ways, I think this is the most common reading. Um, so the Agata itself, after um, after we utter this line, we then we then emphasize that it's not um, only our ancestors uh, whom God liberated, but but um, uh, even us uh, were liberated along with them. Uh, something that would maybe sound dissonant um, or discordant in some way uh, for for many Jewish communities throughout the centuries who didn't necessarily feel that uh, sense of liberation. Um, and in the Mishnah also, this is this is said like to, to express this um, identification with leaving Egypt is then, therefore, we are obligated to thank, praise, glorify, extol, exalt, honor, bless, revere, and, and praise the one who performed for our ancestors and for all of us these miracles, um, just trying to sort of channel this sense of gratitude, of jubilation, of euphoria. Um, that again might be hard to access at times, and um, and in a in another sort of classic formulation of this this reading of of, of the line from Mishnah, um, Maimonides, the uh, great um, medieval Jewish philosopher and commentator, uh, born in Spain, lived most of his life and did most of his writing in Egypt. Um, 
emphasize that this is a time for every Jewish person, even the least liberated among us, to taste and feel and embody liberation. Um, and I'll just quote my monogies here. In each and every generation, a person must present themselves uh, as if they themselves have now left the slavery of Egypt. Therefore, when a person, and this is, this is the opposite of the emptying <laughs> um, of fasting, but therefore, when a person feasts on this night, on, on the night of Pesach, they must eat and drink while they are reclining in the way of freedom. And so this is like literally physically relax your body, <laughs> lean and refine it, and feel that. Each and every one, both men and women, must drink four cups of wine on this night. This abundance should not be reduced. Even a poor person who is sustained by tzedakah, who is sustained by charity, should not have fewer than four cups. Even the poor of Israel should not eat until they are able to be in a place where they can recline, right? So no matter who you are, this is a night where regardless of what your current circumstances are, where you are in some hierarchy of power um, or resources in this community, this is the time where everybody um, feels as if they are they are liberated. Um, so that's 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 um, another sort of major trend in how this line is interpreted. And then just one one additional one. Um, is that, uh, and this perhaps is addressed especially to people who, um, in the community who historically did, did not feel that um, a sense of present liberation was successful um, in some way, um, that this is that this is read as as a command to make yourself feel ready for liberation. Um, so the the Chida, eighteenth century. Um, commentator uh, writes she flaheva dam biatse hanot keilu halayla hazo who nachonu mezuman with says me Israel that you uh, that a person excites sort of energizes themselves and and undertakes preparation as if on this very night um, you are ready and and invited to leave Egypt. Um, So those are some of the trends over uh, nearly two millennia um, of Jews living uh, in dispersed communities as minorities in other people's lands, mostly in Christian lands and Islamic lands, um, and uh, without political sovereignty uh, in their circumstances, living under other people's dominions, often victims of, of violence and, and virtually always subject to forms of discrimination. Um, historically, in that context, um, it hardly would have occurred, I think, to, to Jewish practitioners and readers of this tradition um, to understand this obligation from the Mishnah uh, beyond the horizons of their own memory of oppression and their own promises of redemption. Um, but in the last uh, 75 years uh, or so, conditions have changed um, in ways that would have been previously unimaginable in, in Jewish tradition. Um, with the rise of a Jewish nation state, uh, militarized Jewish nation state, um, and unjust occupation, power over others. Um, to simply remember being slaves in Egypt and whatever that means in the, in the tradition and, and, to, and to celebrate liberation therefrom is, is incomplete at best um, and perilously, perilously dangerous at worst. Um, and on one hand, uh, Right, the vast majority of Jews living in Israel um, arrived there because they were fleeing from somewhere, <laughs> whether that was pogroms in Russia or the genocide or attacks throughout the Swano region from Morocco to Egypt and uh, Yemen to Iran. Um, and one can imagine how this line from the Mishnah of um, experiencing this 
nay, as if you yourself left Egypt, one can imagine how this would, uh, how this might resonate, resonate for Jews um, who and their descendants sitting with relative security um, in, in Israel. And yet, um, and this is me just speaking as a, not so much as a scholar, but as a, a human being, as a Jew, and yet um, conditions of power, especially the men false power over others, uh, must change how communities interpret their tradition. Uh, there's a danger of seeing every enemy simply as an archetypal Egypt, um, rather than also possibly, in part at least, as symptoms of more complex dynamics of history, of power, of injustice that have to be addressed. Um, and I'd like to suggest uh, that today, as Jews, we really must read that this Mishnaic obligation to see ourselves as if we personally left Egypt in relation to the biblical obligation to not oppress the stranger uh, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. So remembering Egypt in this case must mean remembering the relief and hope of redemption from oppression and the moral compass that oppression can, but doesn't necessarily engender. Um, and uh, just examples of this verse that, um, to my knowledge, have not really been integrated in with this call of the mission on the Haggadah to identify with the liberation of Egypt presently. Uh, but just, I mean, there's lot, many examples of this verse in the, in the Hebrew Bible and the Tanakh of um, don't oppress uh, the stranger or you uh, attended that in a nefesh again because you know the existence, you know the soul of the stranger because you are strangers in Egypt. Um, don't afflict and don't oppress the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Even quite explicitly in the book of Leviticus, um, kids rock me, Ken, uh, treat the, uh, the stranger like a citizen um, and, and love the stranger as yourself because indeed you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Um, I'm interested uh, in what it means to actually integrate that in with, with the making the memory present. Um, again, it's, it's not necessarily a given uh, that oppression makes a person more moral. Um, as James Baldwin wrote in his own meditation on black anti-Semitism, I, I know, and I'm quoting Baldwin here, I know that my own oppression did not ennoble me. Um, so the biblical command in a context of ancient Israelite power, right? That's where that biblical command comes from. It's from an ancient circumstance where the Israelites did have, um, have, have, have political sovereignty and power. Um, in that context, to love the other and treat them with dignity because you know what it's like to be oppressed draws upon the depths of human experience in order to subvert a most dangerous tendency of human nature. Um, to read the Pesach Haggadah's call to see yourself as if you personally were liberated from Egypt in relation to do not oppress the stranger, for you were strangers in Egypt, is to hold this crucial tension um, at the nexus of persecution and privilege, one's own suffering and suffering of others. So today, um, In the midst of this horrific war, um, uh, the call for uh, this reflection on Egypt can essentially be a reminder, um, don't do to others what we ourselves have experienced. Don't do to others what we ourselves have experienced.
looking forward to our conversations in which our provoking suggestions offered by Bob and Sabina Graham. And hopefully at a beautiful place here at the GT we want to bring these things into the light. And we can all of these sites forward with the human experience everywhere and everybody in the world. It is my honor now to call upon uh, Dr. Arthur Holder, historian of Christian spirituality, with a particular interest in defending the legal biblical interpretation, mysticism, and the writings of Venerable David. Yeah. You were close to the line. A priest of the Episcopal Church. He was professor and academic dean at the Church Divinity School of the Pacific, before serving as dean and vice president of academic affairs uh, at the Graduate Theological Union between 2002 and 2016. In the American Academy of Religion, Dr. Arthur has served as co chair of the Christian Spirituality Group between 2003 and 2008 and a member of the Theological Education Committee from 2013 to 2016. He is an active member in the Society for the Study of Christian Spirituality, for which he served as president in 2009. At the GTU, he gave a distinguished faculty lecture on Will Spirituality Have a Pass in 2010, and the annual meeting of the Sacred Text on Religious Experience at Sacred Text in 2013. He received the GTU Excellence in Teaching Award in 2019. We're honored to have you, Dr. Holder, and you can share some experiences in your life. Thank you, Marcia. It is a great honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, as I think, I feel like an outsider and a good way in the sense that, I mean, the this program is focused on Jewish and uh, Muslim uh, texts, experiences, interpretations. Um, and so I'm very honored as a, uh, to represent, in this case, uh, an outside view. Um, and thinking of uh, anticipating that Lent may not be as familiar to some of the people in the audience as um, either Ramadan or Professor. Indeed, even among Christians who are here, let me not be. It's not as big as major event. Okay, so I'm saying that there. I want to start with three differences in um, where Lent fits within Christianity compared to where Ramadan and um, Passover fit within those traditions. Um, for one thing, it's too late to prepare for it because we're halfway through. Right? <laughs> At least those of us who follow the the Western uh, Christian calendar, uh, Eastern Church this year, Easter's later and some Lent is later. But uh, for us, we're actually this is the twentieth day of the forty days, um, and it isn't a uh, itself the thing. It is the preparation for the thing, which is Pascha. Easter, as we call it in uh, English speaking countries. So, uh, Lent is itself a preparation. Um, and the other difference is that uh, Lent is not in the New Testament. There is no biblical basis for that. Um, and there's no instructions for Lent uh, in, in the New Testament. So, tradition has had to uh, develop that. Uh, first of all, sort of what is that? Uh, the word comes from an old English word meaning lengthen, length. So we can think of it as a time to stretch oneself, um, but probably originally just meant it's springtime when the days are getting longer. Um, and uh, in, in that's the, the English name for it is Lent, but in most other languages, it's just known by something that means 40 days. So it's the 40 day fast or the great fast. Uh, and it's the 40 days before Easter, um, recalling the number 40, recalling the 40 days that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, also the 40 days of fasting for Moses and for Elijah uh, in the Bible. 
Um, it was, we don't know exactly when it started, but it was made canonically official in 325 uh, at the Council of Nicaea. And uh, soon then and soon after, at least, uh, became associated with the preparation of candidates for baptism at Easter. So a lot of the liturgies of Lent are um, had to do with that kind of preparation for conversion. And this is a tie-in, and remembering those who have been baptized, participating with the catechumens and reliving, as it were, their own uh, preparation once again, so that every year, uh, and then there comes a renewal of the baptism of the house um, at Easter that is um, uh, along with those who are joining the community for the first time. Um, in, uh, in Western Christianity, Lent begins on Ash Wednesday. Uh, on a Wednesday because the Sundays in Lent aren't counted among 40 days. So you'd have to start on a Wednesday to, to get there. Um, although the Sundays are still days of penitential discipline. In the Eastern Church, uh, the Great Fast includes Sunday. So for them, uh, Lent will begin on Monday and then continues uh, until Holy Week. Um, the traditional triad of practices for Lent are prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And there's a lot in the uh, tradition about how these three go together. It's not an option where you can go, this year I think I'm going to go with prayer. You know, I did fasting last year. It's a package deal. Um, in the, the fifth century, a bishop named Peter Chrysologus uh, said, uh, prayer knocks at the door, fasting obtains, mercy receives. Prayer, mercy, and fasting, these three are one, and they give life to one another. Um, the, this triad of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving uh, can be found in the New Testament in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, where Jesus is giving advice about each of those three things and says, uh, when you're giving alms, don't be like the hypocrites who do it where everybody can see it, but do it in secret. And when you pray, don't do it out on the street corner, but go into your private chamber and pray there. And when you're fasting, don't uh, you know put ashes on your head and look like you're you know in sackcloth and everybody knows it. But fast in secret, and your Father in heaven will reward you in secret. Now it's kind of an irony that that is the gospel that is um, read every Ash Wednesday at the liturgy at which people receive ashes on their head. Um, and so is this dilemma. Uh, Jesus said, don't disfigure your face, and we just disfigured your face. What do I do? So I always counsel people, just do whatever, think what comes most comfortable for you, and then do the opposite. And you, you know, probably work out much. Uh, but the, the purpose of fasting is to restrain the passions, to foster self-control, and to be reminded of our dependence on God. So very much so we were talking about that emptying so that you can, can be filled. Um, it raises the issue, though, of the relationship between the external practice and the internal transformation. And I think that's something that's true in any uh, tradition that has asceticism as a part of it. Uh, the te great teachers always say the main thing is the inner spiritual transformation. Uh, but if you take that too far, it becomes so don't worry about the externals. And how do you maintain that um, that sense of, yes, it is the inner spiritual transformation that matters, and this is a vehicle to it, this, this is what helps you with that. Um, in 2021, Pope, ba Pope Francis gave a, um, a Lenten message in which he really uh, stressed that. And so he said, do you want to fast this Lent? Fast from hurting words and say kind words. Notice the balance. You're fasting from the negative to the positive. Fast from sadness, be filled with gratitude. Fast from anger, be filled with patience. Fast from pessimism, be filled with hope. Fast from worry, have trust in God. He goes on after a while. Um, fast from grudges and be reconciled. Fast from words 
be silent and listen. This has become a very popular, um, uh, this, you can see it in note cards and I, it's on Facebook, uh, you know, I, I, I'm even in, in my circuits, I'm an Episcopal priest, not Roman Catholic, but we like a lot of people think, hey, Francis is good for me. Uh, everybody, he's everybody's special. So, um, you know, that's very popular. And yet, so do I still fast? Do I still, you know, not eat? I don't know about that. Um, and that gets to the question so, what are the rules for that? And I'll have to tell you, there are not many left. <laughs> but I'm going to start with where they were. In the early Middle Ages, at least, fasting was pretty strict. I would say, you know, it can keep you from it. Uh, no food at all on Ash Wednesday or Good Friday. So you'd be going like 36 hours without eating. Uh, for the rest of Lent, no food from midnight until 3 p.m. the next day. Um, 3 p.m. because that was the hour at which Christ died on the cross. And you would just take one meal, uh, normally, really at 3 p.m., and then not be until, until 3 p.m. the next day. You did get to have water, and as a matter of fact, you also had wine and beer, because probably that was safer than drinking water <laughs> in those days. Um, so um, throughout Lent, no animal meat or fats, no eggs, um, but fish was okay because they're not warm blood. So it's the blood that they're keep you away from. Uh, no eggs or dairy. Uh, people subsisted then on bread, vegetables, and salt uh, for those seven weeks, and almost seven weeks, and no sexual intercourse um, during that time. Now, the Eastern Orthodox churches today continue to hold to no meat and no dairy during Lent, and no wine or oil, uh, except on Saturdays and Sundays. So, John Clintos from the Orthodox Institute should really be giving this talk because they, they have a more robust uh, left these days. Uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, since 1966, the fasting rules have been relaxed so that it's now really basically two rules. Uh, no meat on Fridays during Lent. And on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, uh, just one meal and two snacks. Yeah, you're going, that's not a fast. That's like, you're in a hurry. <laughs> but yeah, but that's, that's what it's, it's come to. Um, liturgical services are simplified throughout the season. No flowers on the altar. Uh, no singing of Alleluia, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, in the West, although in the East, that's not a rule. Crosses and images may be veiled or uh, removed from the church. So it's anything that's kind of um, especially if it's made out of gold brass or something like that, so they're going to simplification. Um, well, everything I've said so far applies to everybody in the church. But then it's also a time for individual uh, acts of self-denial. So that's why I titled this talk, uh, What Are You Giving Up for Lent? This is a question that you often hear um, that Christian folks will ask each other. What are you giving up for Lent? And I, it, it almost sometimes seems like a trivialization. Huh? So it's like, yeah. But I want to bring out the positive side of that as the emphasis on individual freedom, choice, voluntary taking something on as a, as a discipline. Um, these days, it's typically something like coffee or chocolate or soda or alcohol. Um, uh, I used to always give up meat during that and then there was a Easter that I just didn't go, about four years, I just didn't go back to it. So now I'm not sure if I'm still giving up meat for Lent. Or something, you know what I'm saying? It used to be allowed, but now it's not allowed. So I mean, for me, I don't think. Um, but this this year I'm giving out of alcohol, and maybe I won't go back to that. Um, because give up one thing each year, sooner or later, I guess I'll, I'll be a Jenny. <laughs> Um, so, uh, some people don't give up not just things to consume, but maybe give up social media. Uh, I'm not sure if that's always a sacrifice, but um, for some people that is. Or no television after 8 o'clock at night or something like that. I've heard of some people uh, that only take cold showers during Lent, no hot water, or uh, sleep without a pillow. 
Uh, you say, I mean, it's something that is uncomfortable and how, what does that mean? Does God care when you don't have to tell him that? But no, it's a reminder. It's a reminder uh, uh, to you of time of, uh, well, I'm hesitating because there's so many ways that can be interpreted. Reminder of your dependence on God. Reminder of there are people who have to sleep on the streets who don't have a cup to give up. Um, there are all of this is a, a way of looking at it. Now, the emphasis on individual choice, what are you giving up for Lent, um, can sound like a very modern approach, but it's actually has an ancient pedigree. And if you look at the uh, St. Benedict's Rule for Monks, which is in the, the sixth century, he has a chapter uh, 49 on the observance of Lent. I just want to end by uh, reading that short chapter and then coming on the bit. First thing he says is the life of a monk ought to be a continuous life. And that brings out an important aspect of it, which is that yes, Lent is 40 days in preparation for Easter, but the analogy there is that life is a preparation for heaven, for an eternal Easter. Um, and so um, every our life should be a left a fasting in preparation for that eternal feast all the time. But he says, since few, however, these days have strength for that, we urge the entire community during these days of Lent to keep its manner of life most pure and to wash away in this holy season the negligences of other times. This we can do by refusing to indulge in evil habits. So there's the negative. And by devoting ourselves to prayer with tears, to reading, to compunction of heart and self-denial. And so then he says, um, we'll add to the usual me measure of our service something by way of private prayer and abstinence from food and food or drink, so that each of us will have something above the assigned measure to offer God of his own will with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So it's, yes, we we'll are all do this together. We we're eating in the in the common refectory, and there'll be no need and that kind of thing. But each of you should have something of your own that's your choice that you decide. Um, this Lent, I'm not going to do, or I am going to do. As he said, extra prayer. So there are many people who say, you know, I'm going to get up early and read Psalms, uh, you know, before breakfast or something like that. Um, uh, in other words, he says, let each one deny himself some food, drink, sleep, needless talking, and idle jesting. Maybe that's where the social media comes in. And look forward to Holy Easter with joy and spiritual longing. Then he says something very important. Everyone should, however, make known to the abbot, that is the, the leader of the, um, in charge of the monastery, what he intends to do, since it ought to be done with his prayer and approval. And I think that balancing of the individual initiative and the communal responsibility not to, and the rule of Benedict actually uh, has a, a common theme of moderation. So part of the reason for this was surely so that the abbot would keep people from going over them. Uh, and, and because that becomes a matter of pride. You're, you're giving up, I'm giving up a lot. Really. <laughs> so um, you, you need someone to kind of confirm that. It says, whatever is undertaken without the permission of the spiritual father will be reckoned as presumption and vainglory, not deserving of a reward. Everything must be done with the Adam's approval. Um, so applied to all of the Lenten disciplines, this chapter of the, the Benedictine rule suggests there's a delicate balance that involves the person and the community, the rules of the church, and the voluntary initiative of the human part. And I think it then goes along with that balancing of the external expectations with the internal transformation. Um, that is the, part of the way that it gets, um, that you, you let needs to be something that you do, not just something that happens to you. And um, all of this in the tradition is a way of helping to make that possible. Yeah.
before we open it up uh, to questions and perhaps a conversation amongst yourself or feedback or reflections from each other's thoughts. And while we're giving that a thought, I want to just go around the room and see if you'd like to name something that we haven't named yet that you're observing in your in your tradition, just so that we can be safe to do anyone who is going through a spiritual transformation revolution. Um, can I add about the Shia practicing for the Ramadan? We observed since the last in the end of the Ramadan, like the Sunni Muslim, but we did a different direction in the early morning after the evidence of the public party in the end of the Ramadan. So, is it not necessary? All of the mosque is somehow happy ones for us because in 10 days in the end of the month is kind of kind of a moving level and so we have a different approach somehow in the Ramadan. Yeah, with most of the Shia centers uh, will be donned in black starting from the 19th night which is the night that the uh, Ali was uh, struck by the sword while he was in his prayer and then he stayed sick for three days and then he talks so away killed the 21st and then the, the last week then turns to be a uh, I think it adds to the spirituality because they're staying as well but then that's a, a slight nuance of how it's yeah. celebrated by the yeah. thanks anything else you'd like to name the Baha'i faith is currently in their fast um remember I <laughs> we start on the first so the seventh, so um, six days, and we go to the Nowruz, which is the Persian New Year's, the Baha'i, and it's also the Baha'i New Year's. And we fast the same way as uh, our brothers and sisters. Um, so, uh, I honestly, uh, I used to dread this as a child, or if I get at 15 is when you're able to start fasting until seven of the day of the year that you can fast. And, um, and now it's actually I, I welcome, and, and I realize how much how much we think about food and planning. Um, and uh, but let's leave there, everybody here. This is sweet. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I would love to have an guitar for a pep talk dinner and the community here on campus would be amazing to do something like that. It's a, it's a thought of you know student reflection. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to name some Christian practices that we do at home um, during Lent. We, by tradition, at the Reformed Church, we call us, um, we do not do uh, Ash Wednesday properly, and the prayers and giving are there, but not much of the fasting. Yeah, I'm eating. Um, well, but, but yeah, <laughs> but during the, the week, we call it the holy week before the Easter, we uh have worship every day, mm -hmm. and uh, we also offer um uh the Lord communion on, on Thursday. And the church are really packed those days, like, even the people don't really go to church, and very for, for people, very important to be together during those. Um, yes. I don't want to name the spiritual aspect of it. Uh, for Ramadan, the focus has been for community focuses of the media that when to fast, what not to eat, and and if you was exempt and and uh, you can make it up some other time of the year if you can. But there is some element about the spirit of Ramadan that cannot be replicated any other time of the year. Mm -hmm. This is the one activity that Muslims worldwide do at the same time. Mm -hmm. They gather every night after breaking the fast for an extended communication of prayer. That even if you make it up some other time, that will not happen. The dessert that is being served. Is not made any other kind of the year, or it does not taste the same. <laughs> yeah. So that's the element of community that 
the joy is community engaged together in, a, in, a, in an act at the same time. Individually, yes, we can pass, but it's not the same approach or spirit or, or the version. Yeah, I love that. I got from other options here, Director of the Interreligious Chaplaincy Program here at the GTU. Uh, yes, and I resonate with that, the, the community spirituality. So sort of, you know that everyone in the world at this time is fasting along with you. And even though Muslims will fast throughout the year, either to make up their last fast or any other recommended fast, the, the spirit that one feels during the month of Ramadan is really mm -hmm. a lot of food. And if I may add, if you invite Muslims over for dinner, they will not ask you what time. <laughs> yes, but please. Yeah, um, thank you for the talk. It's really, and I love to see the, you know, the ways that they're so many different. Um, I think that joy, I was thinking also of the joy of breaking the fast because, you know, the fasting day starts out with you know eating and then you just go through these slumps and then it can be like the late afternoon euphoria and then the joy of breaking the fast it's sort of like I didn't think I was gonna make it and like I got strength through a law or, and um that joy of being able to do something that's very difficult it can translate also that different gratification and it reminded me a lot of what Dr. Schoenkopf was saying about the joy even if you're not in a perpetual state of joy, you can take moments of joy within the difficulties. And those joys within the difficulties are, are magnified. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sophie. And, and I think that is something that resonated in your talks, and that is the um, excitement, uh, the excitement of receiving after emptying out, the excitement of uh, uh, enjoying liberation. Uh, and the excitement of preparing for uh, Easter. Um, and, it, and it's more than, I think, just an excitement of seeing the food. It, there's deep down that excitement you get after having denied yourself. So I can do this. I can take this on. I can take on something more in my life. So uh, I, I think that resonates very well with the, the, with the talk that you want to share with us. So I can think of something I have some comments for the understanding of the question, but it was really beautiful. And the book that when we stood together, it was from the Egypt, from the Misra. Yeah, which is what's that like that? Yeah, so it has a, actually an ancient Persian book, mm -hmm. which is in a so big, lovely, and ancient Persian book that a really well known book, which is. Uh, you can find that in an Avastas book, the book of the Tuesday, with the meaning of the friendship, emotion, and some things like love. And as a, another manifestation of the body of God. So mm -hmm. that's what really reminds me a lot of the things that I know from the intuition time. That was really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, so I was just thinking about the uh, well, first of all, I wanted to say, I mean, this was a very wonderful career for me, and I was um, particularly interested in each of you talked about uh, sort of making this an active process for an individual. And I think that's interesting that you lots of things about. Um, but I also, um, you know, Sam, you didn't talk about this for very good reasons because you talked about some other great stuff, but I'm thinking about. Um, fasting and how we don't fast until actually Passover. When of course we're not fasting, but we are not eating leaven stuff. So there's like also this kind of denial um, element. The that, bread of affliction. Yeah, during that period of time. So. Yeah. That would have been the more uh, appropriate way to go. <laughs> Perfect. Just to jump on that, it, I, I think this enduring conviction that there is a role for religious scholars to play as kind of moral voices in the world. Just, mm -hmm. I mean, hearing, hearing your remarks just renewed my uh, hope that in, in, in your work, in what, what many of you I know are doing in a space like this, to, to bring moral clarity and to ground it in, in tradition. That 
it is it is so powerful and I, I hope you share that and it'll be uh, as well received in wider circles. I think that's the next one. Uh, yeah, that, that work of drawing into the into the depths of the tradition and, and holding up things uh, in it, it, you know, we have we don't think it's have two eyes for a reason, right? It's like these two perspectives and how are you hold them simultaneously and that's that's the work of this, this moment. So yeah. Yeah, I introduced that dichotomy of like the scholar side and the given side, but of course that's BS. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 main, the main philosopher who I study in my research, Martin Buber, wrote this piece uh, where he, he called uh, the, the tendency of academics and intellectuals to see themselves as sort of above the fray and not like they shouldn't get into sort of the activism and the politics because they're scholars and they should get away with it. He called that a betrayal of the intellectuals. <laughs> Thank you. That's Dr. Elizabeth Pena, uh, director for the Center for Arts and Emerging here at the GTU. I think another powerful message that resonated in your talk was that the idea of uh, social justice, the almsgiving that resonated. Um, almsgiving is very important for the month of Ramadan. In fact, Muslims will not celebrate aid until they have paid their due for, for those who are uh, disempowered. And uh, you talk about um, you know thinking of those who are still oppressed uh, as thinking of strangers as citizens, and and that sense of empathy. And you talk about almsgiving, and and then the word slavery and liberation also sort of came up, and slavery from all those things that we think we depend on, so to empty that, and then just depend on God, dependence on God, um, and and I'm wondering. Um, how perhaps our traditions think about slavery and liberation? Just, just those words, slavery and liberation, or, or the the culture of being enslaved and the culture of liberation. Because sometimes we can have a political identity, we can be free uh, in in ways that the world defines free, but our minds may not be educated, may not be. Liberal, we might be enslaved with our own egos, and and I think that sort of jumped out when Sam you were talking about um, how even after being a nation state today, there might still be uh, insecurities where people in power feel that they need to keep people subservient and 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 that's a kind of slavery of of the thought and, and being enchained in our minds and soul, even though we might have military powers, we might have you know, financial stability on the upper hand, but there is something in the mind that is still keeping us enslaved. So I, I think your, your talks really help us to go deep down and understand the deeper meanings and iterations of slavery, liberation, self-denial, emptying out, uh, thinking of embracing the stranger as our own. And I'm wondering if, I know this is a very essential, quintessential question, but how do we stray so far away as communities from our tradition? When we talk about our sacred traditions and our sacred cultures, just this richness and this beauty that can find the human experiment together with such a plus. Of empathy, but uh, I know they're 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 on the direct or easy answers, but how do we stray away from the heavy that comes to mind? The problem with it, between the great man called the extended, uh, and he said, lamented, how many of you don't get anything from your thoughts except hunger and thirst? Uh, uh, con I'm kind of looking into the, pre the more future, more just like. You know, I would say, like, may not may that not be the case for us, but but yeah, there are other traditions are asking all these things from us, and uh, to 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 hold on to that, to hold on to the aspiration and the hope. I, I love it. I love how it frames it in those terms, and and still 
recognize that the ways that we fall short as individuals, as, as collectives, but yet we're still, we're still, we we can do better. We have a vision of what better looks like. That's the I feel like that balancing that hope with the, the despair, the the real situation with with our inherent potential. That's an interesting question. I I um, I find myself often perplexed by traditions because sometimes when we stray from the tradition, we stray from goodness. But of course, the opposite can be true. <laughs> I mean, I uh, for me the question is, uh, you know, how do we engage with traditions? All of I don't. I've never heard of any uh, long-standing uh, religious tradition, culture, cultural tradition of any kind that doesn't have its shadows <laughs> uh, and its, its dangers, in addition to very beautiful, righteous things. And um, so I think so much of it is a question of um, <laughs> religious communities on um, being having a sense of hermeneutical responsibility and having a sense of uh, that what we do with this tradition is uh, is, a, is, is is the question. <laughs> yeah. And you're talking about really raised the question of how do we know we're not being lazy, like how are we making this meaningful and appropriate to our time without kind of compromising on the rigor or the intensity or and relating that to the question of you know, slavery, I think in, in Christianity, the many, many generations of Christians who celebrated uh, liberation from the slavery of sin without stopping to think, mm -hmm. oh, maybe like actual slaves should also be liberated. <laughs> no, no, it just means uh, sin. You know, there's a that that and it maybe is related in some ways to that the external and the internal um because if there's no external there the symbol becomes an empty symbol so if you're celebrating deliverance from the slavery of sin without asking the question what does that mean in concrete human terms for people who are enslaved then the symbol no longer has a it you, you may still be talking about it, but it's not making the kind of difference that it needs to make. It's lost its power because you you know put it in the mm. So I mean that may be I don't know that's not a, it's not an answer to why the traditions have gone astray or we've gone astray from them, but that may be for me it was part of the answer to how it happened. Mm. So we've just become you know, kind of Domesticated these uh, these rich symbols and practices into a way that they, you know, they, they serve a purpose, but not the intended purpose. That spiritual aspect. Yeah. Right. We want to maybe take a moment to address if there are any questions in the in this room. Okay. That's all right. said thank you for a great coverage. <laughs> 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 Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it was a very special time to be together and you know, to be together. And um, tomorrow's a, a, an all day conference as well on uh, food and safer sex, all day conference. And I've been thinking about some of the notes I've been preparing. Um, and just in terms of what we've shared, I've learned a lot about, you know, I was thinking about individual and community aspects, the bodily practices, um, or something I've talked a little bit more about more food for thought. We talked a lot about fasting, but also food for thought. The two things that um, emerge from really all of the presentations on, um, one is dimensions of time and temporality, like what, what happens when there's intensified practices in, in the traditions that we've heard about here, right? Um, uh, and by that, we mentioned most of the tradition. And 
like what that does for us in in an intensive way and how it kind of prepares us for the rest of the year. But I want to say, I want to expand it even beyond that to what it does for us as individuals to feel ourselves as part of a community, past, present, and future. So that's one thing that really struck me in terms of the, the time dimensions of we do these things intensively for a period because it, it's, it's a certain kind of, um, it develops bottom habits and practices and ways of thinking then that then sustain us. Um, and in that, I was also thinking about how for those who um, whose practices are God-centered, right, or see this mo these moments as a continuation of past and, and the other world, you know, the world to come. These are all ways in which they think about like this is just a small little thing as part of you know much larger history. So that was really the little move from all we talked. And the other was um relationships. Uh, that's a big part of you know again individual community relationships with past present the future or here world and the other world. But I was thinking also about kind of multi-species belonging. Like when we're more thoughtful about our food, not just what we can and can't eat, but the laws as Dr. Kamal mentioned, but about like where we get our food, how we get our food, and what our relationship is to plants and animals and everything around it. It's again, it's that food for thought <laughs> that I'm thinking about. So it's again, all your presentations also raised for me questions around um human relations, of course our relationship to God, but um in so many ways a kind of multi species belong and how do we think our, our of ourselves as part of this larger thing that it takes for us to, to be. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you for the more sort of comments and reflections you may find on what your all your presentations are Thank you, Dr. Minimichi Rana Founding Director of the really uh, what I heard too is it's a community, it's not individual. We don't feel like we talk about well, how we go astray, especially in this society today. We're all about being stoic, being strong, and being individuals. But even our commission saying is out of many, one, right? So it's like when we do fast, when we do our community, when we have a strong community bond, easier to be practicing than being your individual and being out on your own or being, you know, somewhere else. Um, the community really, when you when you fast together or do whatever the the, the spiritual practice is together. You, you you feel that common bond. Can you feel that together? And we have strayed as a society out and and now we have put oh religious kind of like the others. And um, it's not cool, you know, just that and, and but it is. I mean it, it comes together, you have that you have a natural bond. You find that natural bond and then you find it within other brothers and sisters and other kids. And that common bond is the love and the community of humanity. And that's where we're resting here. Thank you. I have to say it's another behind. I love the idea of when we got Ramadan. I love the idea that people all over the world, but two billion times, are turning to God. And I love it. Um, and I look forward to Ramadan and I'm happy that I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but we add <I'm> on. <laughs> um, yes. And, and uh, we're sent over the age of seven. So. <laughs> 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 but that, that uh, sense of commonality and, and, and I think our actions uh, go beyond us. That, uh, that our, our sacrifice is more than personal. It uh, goes into the, to the universe, if you will. And, uh, and I get benefit from your uh, past. So thank you. <laughs>
there, there's a particularity about Ramadan that Ramadan is a sacred month before Islam as well. And then when it comes in Quran, the command to fast, it actually is is making a connection to previous traditions as well. So both the month carries on the, the, the pre-Arabic, uh, pre-Islamic origins. So fasting is going to carry along the practices of putting the way Judaism and Christianity, other, other traditions that, that, that predated Islam. And then uh, the month, it, to, to your point about the sacred time, you're actually not supposed to do the practice of Ramadan at other times. It's, it's actually forbidden to do this uh, continuous fasting at other times. The most you can do is a day on a day off, a day on a day off, which I always like to have this urge, like I will do that sometime in my life, uh, inshallah, maybe, but but that's the most it, at, at other times as well. So it's, it is this kind of intense workout that you only do kind of once per year. If, if we think about the prayers, like these speed bumps throughout the day and based on the sun, as I mentioned, Ramadan is based on the moon and you know, it's like this year, like once in a year to do this really intense workout. The prayers are these little little moments of uh, of, of uh, spiritual workout throughout the day. And I think the, the last thing about the the, the time um, is that the time element and the, and the communal element, it, it's the um, like the, the sort of balance between like the night and the day. And you're usually you think of the night as the time that the uh time for the night prayer, time for rest, time for, for personal time. And in some in, in some ways it flips this and but during the day maybe you're still going out and doing your things, but you're in, intensely kind of focused in, in the inside. And then there's something about the night where yes, you, you're still doing a night prayer, but you're all of a sudden you're in community and then the night becomes the time where there's like the, the greatest social interaction. And uh, so to, it's an interesting inversion to this. It also messes with your biological clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A new meaning for night life. Yeah. <laughs> Are there special there's special prayers for Ramadan? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's so much to talk about, right? There's the the, the tradition of doing tarawih, which is rawa is actually like to to rest too. It's an interesting dimension where uh, most mosques here will at least do the Quran at least uh, one time throughout the month, and so there's a. Uh, <laughs> actually get quite a lot of uh, rest or uh, uh, exercise going up and down and up and down in the prayer. So, you know, it's relaxing to the soul that it is. So, so it is a little bit physically demanding. Uh, and it usually can be last two or so hours if you start from the beginning and finish, um, you know, with the congregation. But many, many mosques will also choose twice through the entire Quran. And it's a practice that goes back to the, the, the time of the prophet. So that has a nice um, so still or so shall shall or there's a kind of right? It's that idea of like a, a linking practice that is with some of the intentions of presence. I was just thinking in, in, with the high pass, there were certain prayers for the period of fast. And when they when we start, it's like saying all the time. It's just it's a, such a joy to say those prayers during that time. Thank you. Thank you so much for the last two minutes of our uh, event. Any last thoughts or comments that you'd like to share? I think a little bit more time today, but I also feel like, oh, I came so far. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was really... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I was just thinking so much about the, the emphasis on liberation or liberal thinking or, or freedom. And if we think about two questions about slavery, the, the central concept for for anthropology and Islam is the human being is not a, a slave, mm -hmm. and, and so sometimes maybe it, it, it's you know for me Ramadan is actually about realizing all these ways of oh I'm, I'm so enslaved to these various other things that that I don't have room I don't have space to be like in, enslaved to recognize that I'm not enough. The, the the irony is you are whether you recognize it or not. Um, so, so Ramadan has got time to recognize the object that I am not, and that the, the, the physically 
feel that sensation, you spiritually cultivate that sensation. So it becomes then you realize your own reality. <laughs> I was I was having similar thoughts from the from the Jewish tradition perspective, where there's this sort of modern liberal reimagining of the Exodus story as going from slavery to doing whatever you want to do. You know? <laughs> but actually, right, like the, the term for for slavery, Abu uh, in 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 Egypt is the same term for spiritual practice in the temple or elsewhere, and and when and when Moses says, "Let my people go," right, like Actually, if you look closely, it's, you know, let my people go uh, do this work in relation to God. So it's really this question of slavery is a question of to whom. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are enslaved to other people um, like without agency, um, as opposed to being slaves, being, I mean, oh, being, being workers, being laborers uh, in relation to the divine. Uh, it almost makes the the human subjugation human the slave that's like a form of idolatry mm -hmm. in some way that it's really a question to who by him. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. Bob Dylan said, you gotta serve somebody. Yes, yes. But maybe servant is also because it has different it evolves different things of so slave or servant. Certain kinds of surrender. And just to put a fine point on, on your beautiful remark too, we're entering into this season where we're thinking about liberation in a time where there's soft wars, and we're thinking about fasting in a time where there's soft wars. And I mean, this is maybe a, a fair intention, if you know, but if you, you know, may, may there be liberation, may there be uh, an end to this, to this circumstance. Thank you everyone for your time and your energy and your presence. We also must thank the Los Angeles Foundation for their generous lines and awards to conduct these and organize this event. Thank you, Dr. Lina. Lina Aronoff, uh, director of the Center for Student Studies here, thank you for your presence. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Esterson, she's chair of the Space Place and the Interpretation Department here. So it's really nice that you may come. Uh, to join us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to our presenters.